Let's lift our Bibles. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And it's good to be back with you, and I'm so grateful. Hey, well, thank you. Amen. <laughs> it's good to be missed. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, so grateful once again to, uh, to my great staff and then also to uh, Darren and uh, Jeremy, who uh, I call them the dynamic duo, who uh, do such a great job in my, in my absence. Give them a big hand, will you? Amen. 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 I've already heard both of the messages, and they were powerful. Enjoyed them. Praise God. I was edified by them. And uh, what a blessing to be able to, to be able to take some time off and know that uh, the church is still in good hands. Uh, Becky and I mainly uh, did work around the house, but uh, we did get to get away for a few days, and we're, we're grateful for that, and we're uh, hopefully refreshed and ready to go at it again. You know, a few years ago, there was a, a man who so many considered to be successful. In fact, he would have considered himself to be very successful. But then, at a certain point, for some reason, he began to even question what that success meant, whether it really was success. In fact, he began to question what his purpose in life was, period. And he went into a great depression. And I'll tell you how that story ends at the end of this message. But I want you to think about that as we think about needing a miracle. Because that man needed a miracle. Anybody here need a miracle today? Could you, you could use a miracle? And I bet if we took some time and listened, there'd be some stories that uh, would cause us to be in awe of how great the need is. So I'm hoping today that we can give you some things that will help you. We're talking here about the feeding of the 5,000. I find this story so amazing because when you begin reading in the beginning of this, of this passage, it talks about how that Jesus said to his disciples, let's get away and get some rest. And so they go to this deserted or remote place on purpose to get away for a while, and yet they find themselves right in the middle of a great opportunity for ministry. The people found out where they were, and they followed them. And they, as they were following them, they gave no heed. They didn't think anything about what this might mean, what they might need. They just wanted to hear Jesus. Well, would to God we had that kind of hunger today for the Word of God. Amen. They followed Jesus out to this deserted place, and because they didn't give a lot of thought to this, after he taught for quite a while, and by the way, they never got the rest. You know, our God, Jesus as, as a man needed rest, but as God, he wanted to meet needs. And he came out to meet the needs of these people, and he taught them. As it says, they, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And as Jesus taught them, and time went on, the day drug on, and all of a sudden, these people realize they don't have anything to eat. There were, the Bible says here, 5,000, but notice carefully it says 5,000 men. If you add the children and women, there were probably about 15,000 people here. Think about that. And this is the only miracle, by the way, that's recorded in all four Gospels. Do you get the idea that God wants us to get this message? Every Gospel carries this miracle. This is important. There are four steps that we learn, that we see here when a miracle is needed in our lives. So if you need a miracle this morning, please pay close attention. Four steps to be able to have a miracle take place in your life. First of all, identify the problem. Now, the problem here is pretty obvious. How do you feed 15,000, at least 15,000 people in a remote place where there's nowhere to get food? How do you do that? You say it's impossible. That's right. Look what it says here in verses 34 through 36. Just if you'll glance at all these phrases. There was a great multitude, a deserted or a remote place and nothing to eat. No access to food. Now, 
for you and I, the lesson here and the point of this whole thing is this. Listen carefully. Every miracle begins with a problem. <laughs> you say, well, that's pretty obvious, preacher. I know it is. But I may be talking to some of you today that have a problem identifying your problem. And because you either can't identify your problem or you won't identify your problem, you're never going to see a miracle in your life. Our friends in, in the Christ-centered recovery will tell you, until you stop denying that you have a problem and own up to the problem and admit you have a problem, until that happens, you can't see a miracle. There'll never be a change. So if you don't have a problem, you don't need a miracle. But if you have a problem today, I have good news for you. I have great news for you. You are a perfect candidate for a miracle. Now, your, your problem may be physical. It may be spiritual. It may be material. It may be financial. Whatever. It doesn't matter. The starting point, if you are to see a miracle in your life, is that you have to admit you have a problem. Some of you, your friends have told you you have a problem. Your family's told you you have a problem. But you don't think you have a problem. Well, there will never be a miracle as long as you're in denial. As long as you don't think you need anything, you can't see the miracle. So the first thing you have to do is identify it. Own up to the, to the fact you have a problem and identify it. And then number two, accept responsibility for the problem. God wants us to get concerned about the situation before he does anything about it. He wants you to be as concerned about it as he is. Look at verses 35 through 36. This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. The disciples tell Jesus, send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Let me ask you a question. Who saw the need first? Who do you think saw the need first? Jesus or the disciples? Well, of course, Jesus did. But I want you to notice something here. He saw the problem way in advance before they saw it. But I want you to notice he didn't do anything about it until the disciples got concerned about it. This is an important point. When they accepted responsibility, listen, then he got involved. Do you see what that's teaching us today? Here's the point. You may be having a problem with your marriage, and you don't even recognize it yet. Your spouse has tried to tell you there's a problem, but you can't see it, and you're in denial about it. Once again, when God sees a problem and he recognizes it, listen, he wants to work on it. He wants to take care of it in your life. But he won't work the miracle until you first recognize yourself that you have a problem. We're going to see in just a moment why this is so important to God. Some of you have a financial problem. And God knew about that financial problem long before you did. But he waits on you to get concerned about it and to accept responsibility for it before he does anything about it. Now, I want you to notice, the disciples see the need finally, and they come to Jesus, and notice, they say, Jesus, you do something about this problem. I want you to notice something else here. Look, look, look how they put it. You do something about it, and I love this, Jesus says back to them, no, you give them something to eat. And this introduces us to a principle that we often don't think about. Paul reminds us over and over in scriptures that, listen carefully, we are co-laborers with God. It'll help us a whole lot, beloved, the, the faster that we understand that God wants to work with us and not for us. Did you hear me? When it comes to having problem, a miracle in your life, God wants you to be a part of the solution. He wants to be a co-laborer with you. He came to work with us, not for us. He's 
not going to, in other words, let me put it to you this way. It is never God's intent when you need a miracle for him to relieve you of all the responsibility for it. God's big on this responsibility thing. Because responsibility builds character. Responsibility encourages growth. And God is not a genie in a bottle. Christ is not someone that we just call on to meet every need as we sit and lie on the bed eating grapes. God came to work with us. Christ came to work with us, not for us. Some people have the wrong idea about this thing of, of how we are to work with God and God with us. Now, I want you to know something here. The, 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 uh, he gives them an impossible assignment. Not only does he want to make it clear here that they're to be involved in this miracle, but, the, but this thing, it is a miracle. It's impossible. 15,000 people in a deserted area, a remote area away from any, any handy food, and he says, you feed them. Can you imagine what they're thinking? I would have, I would have loved to have been there and seen the look on their face. It probably was a little bit like that owl that hit my window this morning. I, I was asleep this morning about 3 o'clock. And I heard a horrendous crash. And I said, Becky, did you hear that? Bless her heart. She was, I don't know. I get up. I'm glad she didn't hear it because I thought that, I honestly thought somebody had a sledgehammer and had broken the window down and was breaking in their house. I run. I'm looking. I don't see anything and so I flip on the light on the deck, and here's, <laughs> here stands this owl. He's, he's about that tall. And he's looking at me going. <laughs> and, and so for a few moments, we're both just looking at each other. And, and I kept noticing, man, he, he just looked like he'd been hit. Well, he had. For some reason, I don't know where he got the idea that the top window in our house was an entrance to a barn. He's flying straight ahead and pow, hits that thing. He was not crazy. I couldn't wait. I ran to get my phone to get a picture of him, and he flew away. But I'll never forget that look on his face. I, you know, you think of owls as wise. This owl was just knocked out. <laughs> I'd never seen an owl look dumbfounded like that. <laughs> but I think that's probably how the disciples may have looked. You want us to do what? 15,000 people? No place to get food? And you're, you're asking us to do it? And by the way, we shouldn't think it's strange that God asks you and I to do impossible things. May I remind all of us that the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know why that's so important to God? There's a lot of things we could talk about here. There's a lot of reasons why that's important to God. But one thing that has come to me recently that's been a blessing to me that helps, has helped me to understand it, I can't wait to share it with you. God is our Father, amen? Amen. When we're born again, we become children of God. He is our Father. Why is it that it's important to your Father? Why was it important to your Father when you were coming up that you would learn, listen, to trust Him? Because, listen, because He knew how important trusting Him would be as you grew. He knew that there would be times that you as a, as, a, as a youngster growing up would not be able to take on certain things alone and you would need to trust your father. You, listen, you would need to trust his word and you would need to believe in his abilities and you would need, need to have him to come to when you needed assistance. Oh, my friend, please understand this. Our God loves us so much and he sees us so much, so vital a part of his family that faith is that thing that causes us to trust our father and see day after day, day in and day out, year in and year out that God is trustworthy. Worthy. But you'll never know that if you don't ever step out in faith and trust Him. God is saying to us, 
And he's saying to the disciples here, sure, I'm giving you impossible tasks. That's the only way you'll learn to trust me. Did your father ever give you an impossible task that seemed impossible to you? There were many times that my dad would, would give me things like that, and I would think, well, I can't do that. And he would say to me, I'll, I'll be there to help you. God's saying the same thing. Without faith, it's impossible to please me, and the way you please me is to show me that you trust me. Now, some of you didn't have a good father, and, I, and my heart goes out to you. I understand that. But you have a good one now. You have a perfect one now. And he can make up for all that you lacked in your own father's absence. And he wants you to know today that the way you grow is through trust. And that trust has to be in him. But listen, it's, listen. How well would you have grown as a child if you had just been able to do this? Picture this. You're lying in bed on a Saturday morning. And you pick up your cell phone and you text your dad. That's what you do now. And you say, uh, would you bring me my cereal, please? I think I'll just lay in bed today until about noon and uh, just bring me that. And he, and he texts you back <laughs> and says, what? <laughs> and you say, well, you're my, my father. You are here to work for me. No, he, he, a good father would probably do like mine did one time on a Saturday morning when I refused to get up and came in and started playing whatever they play in the army to get you up in the morning. Oh, that's all I remember. He started whistling it. <laughs> and that's when he said to me on that day, boy, I wish I had you in my platoon. And I said, what is the difference? <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm living in your platoon right here. But I learned a lot. Dad didn't let me sleep late on Saturdays. We got up and we had work to do. And I learned to trust that what he was telling me was going to help me in the future. Listen, God doesn't work for us. He works with us. Turn to your neighbor and say that. God doesn't work for us. He works with us. I want you to get that in your mind. God is not a genie in a bottle. You are here to serve him and to work with him. And the wonderful thing is, is that God in heaven says, I want you to co-labor with me. Can you imagine that? What a privilege. And that's what faith is all about. I want you to learn to trust me. And when I tell you something is possible that looks impossible, trust me. That's what he's saying to these disciples. He wanted to stretch them. He wanted them to do the impossible. And he wanted them to see, listen, that they could do it. Now, granted, you know what Jesus could have done. Jesus could have walked over to that crowd and said, let there be food. <laughs> and there would have been food. But where's the fun in that? Where's the spiritual growth in that? Where's the education in that? Where's the character in that? Where's the fellowship in that? Where is the oneness with God? Where is the learning that he really is my father? Where is the, 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 the notion that I finally realize, wait a minute, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God catered to every one of our needs, if every time we prayed and said, just bring it on, he brought it, what would we learn from that? Sure, God wants to provide, just like your own parents wanted to provide for you. But the, uh, catering to your every whim was not on the agenda, at least not in my house. Now, there's three common reactions that people have toward problems when they face them, and it's the same three reactions that the disciples had. So let's look at this. See if, if this reminds you of anything. The first thing that most people do when they're facing an impossible situation is they procrastinate. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you? That's uh, what you do. Finishing your paper for school the night before. Well, you know, Finishing that project, up late, painting the house before 
before you have to go back to work on Monday and so forth. Procrastination. Notice what it says in verse 35. When the day was far spent, his disciples came to him. Did you catch that? When the day was far spent. When do you think they realized that there were 15,000 people there in a remote place that didn't have anything to eat? They'd had all day to think about that. But they waited till the day was far spent. Now here's the question for you and I. What difficult situation are you putting off? You might just want to write it down on the back of your outline. What is it you just keep putting it off? Because it's difficult. You know, I, I'm a list guy. I love lists. I drive my wife crazy with them. But I love lists. But one thing she even notices about my list is she'll say, I keep noticing here in your little daytime here that this, this one particular thing here keeps getting moved down to the bottom. Now, you'll have it here at the top, but it keeps, leave me alone. Why? Don't particularly like it. We move the difficult one away, don't we? We procrastinate. We put it off. Folks, can I tell you something? This is, this is breaking news. Procrastination never works. It never solves a problem. It only makes it worse. Remember that God wants us to take on the impossible. Take on the hard thing and to do it right away. Look at number two, passing the buck. Look at verse 36. The disciples said, send them away. Well, that was nice. That, that, that'll take care of it. Hey, they're out here. There's no food anywhere. There's 15,000 people. They have nothing to eat. They're tired. Just send them away. Oh, good night. Passing the buck. In other words, let's just pretend that the problem doesn't exist. And maybe if we just pretend the problem doesn't exist, it'll go away. You know, out of sight, out of mind. Look the other way. Maybe we can ignore it. What the disciples were saying here to Jesus was, you know, it's not our problem. We didn't ask the people to come out here and hear you, hear you teach today, Lord. I mean, we were, we were on vacation. <laughs> we were taking a break. We didn't ask them to come. If they have a problem, they ought to solve it. It's their responsibility. It's their, it's their, their fault, none of our business. If they're hungry, let them find their own food. That's kind of what they were saying here. You know, one of the biggest cop-outs ever is the phrase, it's none of my business. You know, if you have a friend who's wasting his life, it is your business. In fact, at the end of this message, we're going to talk about the fact that this man who needed a miracle, it's a good thing he had a friend who said, it's my business. You know, if you have a child who's going the wrong direction, it is your business. Remember this, beloved, love cares. And love will find a way. Apathy will always find an excuse. But love will find a way. So don't procrastinate. Don't pass the buck. And then lastly, worry. I love this. Look at verse 37. These guys did all three of these in one act. They says, where will we ever get this kind of money Look what it says. It says, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? 200 denarii was, listen carefully, that was eight months worth of salary for the average worker back then. And the disciples say, we're looking at 15,000. It'll take about, about 200 denarii to buy it. And even if we had it, where are we going to buy it? Now, <laughs> before you get on to these guys, Remember yourself. Lord, we have this impossible, Jesus, think about it. Jesus, we have this impossible situation. 15,000 people. Not enough money to buy food, even if there was some place to buy food. What are you expecting out of us? The solution was standing in front of them. The source was right there. The answer to the problem was looking at them in their face. And you and I, since we know the whole story, we, we, we look at these guys and say, what's the matter with you guys? You had Jesus right there. 
Well, can I remind all of us of something? You have Jesus right there. I will never leave you or forsake you. You know what our problem is? I don't know about the disciples, but I want you to notice something. Some of us have the problem because we haven't heard from God in a while. Remember this thing? Uh, when was the last time you checked in and read it? I want you to remember something in this age of all this technological. This is your email, daily email. This is your daily text. This is your tweet. This is your name it. This is it. And some folks, when they face the impossible, they don't even think about turning to Christ because they haven't heard from him in so long, they don't even think he's with them. Or they know that he'll take them to heaven someday, but they don't feel like that he's with them now. Active in their life. Check in every day and you'll know he is. You'll be reminded, I am with you until the end. I will never leave you or forsake you. I stick closer. I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm as close as the next prayer. You see, these disciples had just, this is amazing, but the disciples didn't even have this excuse. They had just seen Christ do miracle after miracle after miracle. Some of us, we've checked in, but we've gotten so comfortable sitting at the king's table that we just take it for granted and we forget who we're serving. An awesome God. They'd gotten so close to Jesus at this moment, they, they weren't remembering he's the miracle man. The solution to the whole thing was standing right there. But they weren't thinking straight. Why? Because they were worried. Why pray when you can worry? That's some people's motto. Why pray when you can worry about it? No, why worry when you can pray about it? So when you've, listen, by the way, worry is the opposite of faith. And it doesn't accomplish anything. You've heard the old saying, worry is like, it's like a person sitting on the front porch in his rocking chair thinking that by sitting there and rocking, he's going to end up somewhere else. <laughs> It's a lot of action that accomplishes nothing. <laughs> Except maybe put some babies to sleep. That's about the... So listen. Some people are so comfortable with their Lord that they've forgotten who He is and what He can do. Some folks have not checked in with Him in so long. They, would, they don't know what He can do. They haven't heard the assurances they haven't heard him whisper sweetly to them, I'm with you always. But when you finally identify the problem and you accept responsibility for it, then what do you do? Number three, you do what you can. You do what you can. Once again, God's not a genie in a bottle. Christ is not your servant to serve you in selfish things. And even when the work is to be done, he expects you to do what you can first. God waits to see what, listen, always remember this. When it comes to a miracle, God waits to see what you're going to do with what you already have before he steps in. Amen. Let me say that again. God waits to see what you're going to do with what you already have before he steps in. Remember, turn to your neighbor. He works for us. Excuse me, with us, not for us. Hello. Sorry, he works with us, not for us. Look at verses 38 through 39. He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, well, there's five loaves and two fish. I can see them. Then he commanded them to make all sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, Here's where this gets really powerful. When you go back and read this account in the book of John, and in John's account, we have an amazing story. And some of you have read that story and said, that's cute, that's sweet. It's more than cute and sweet, it's powerful. He's more than a little boy. He's a powerhouse of faith. 
He's a young man who gets it. No wonder Jesus said the best thing we can have is childlike faith. The faith of a child. The disciples go out. They've just, you know, they love their Lord enough to say, well, he said to go check and see. We'll go check and see. And immediately, a little boy says, I have, I have five fish and, and the five loaves and two fish. And boy, don't you know that they were, they were snickering about that. Yeah, well, thank you, son. You, you know, we'll take it to the master. Thank you. He'll appreciate that. They're not, they're not believing anything yet. But I want you to notice something. All he had was five barley loaves and two fish, but he gave it to Jesus, and Jesus worked a miracle with it. Amen. Using what the little boy had. Now, there's three things we can learn from this little boy. First, he gave what he had. And I want you to notice something. There were barley loaves. Did you know something about barley loaves? That was the cheapest form of bread you could have back then. Cheapest form of bread. Inferior bread, if you want to say that. He had two small fish. It wasn't much, but it was what he had. Here's what we need to learn from this, my friend. Never underestimate what God can do with ordinary people and limited resources when it's given to him in faith. God's not looking for ability. Some of you are sitting here this morning and you've backed off. You've hesitated to get involved in serving God because you say, who am I? What do I have? God's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. Are you available? The little boy was available. We need to remind ourselves that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, he has chosen to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God loves to take things that the world thinks are foolish and do great things with them. He, you ever got, have you gotten this yet? God loves to see the world go, wow, huh, I'd have never done it that way. Oh, yeah. He uses ordinary people. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you make yourself available to God, he'll wear you out. <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of talent to serve God, but it does take a lot of, here I am, God send me. That's what it takes. Just availability. What the boy was saying was, hey, you know, Jesus, I don't have much, but what I have, I'll give you gladly. And then secondly, notice this. He not only gave him what he had, but he gave him all he had. He wasn't like some of us. Well, I've got uh, five loaves and two fish. You can have three and one. You know, I need to keep a little bit for myself. You know, it is, it's lunchtime, you know. And how do I know that your disciples are going to be fair and handed? I, I've got to keep a little bit myself. He gave all he had. Five loaves and both fish. He didn't hold anything back from God. Folks, listen to me. If you want a miracle, you can't hold anything back from God. Are you holding anything back from God? Lord, use me. And you can have anything, but, but, but not my boyfriend. I got to hang on to him. Not my girlfriend. I got to hang on to her. You can have anything, but not, 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 my, not my money. You know, I got to have a little security back here. You can have anything, but not my career. I've got to do this. You know, don't ask me to make a stand here. You can have anything, but not my time. I mean, I got to have a little time here. He gave all. He gave all. Thirdly, notice this. He gave it immediately. You don't see that. You don't read where the disciples said, uh, you know, the Lord needs... Uh, some help here, and, and the little boy went, eh, let me think about that. Eh. No, he gave it immediately when it was asked for. He didn't hesitate. He didn't wonder about it. He didn't doubt. He just gave it. Now, why don't we give like that when we need a miracle? Well, some people think, well, if I give this to Jesus, I won't have enough to make it myself. If I give it all to Jesus, what am I going to live on? 
We don't really believe, do we? We don't believe that God can take care of our needs. You know, another reason we don't give when we need a miracle is we think, what's the use? My little, my little gift, that, that doesn't mean anything. What if the boy had thought that? Well, all I have is five loaves and two fish. Now, nah, I'm not going to get, I'm not even going to tell the disciples about it because it won't make any difference. In my desk drawer, I have a little bag, a little plastic bag with a couple of dimes and some pennies. And I've tried over and over again to put that in the offering, and I can't make myself do it. Sorry, deacons. But a little girl, when we were in the building on State Avenue and we were preparing to build this and we were launching out by faith, we had a special time. We took up money from the kids. And one of the little girls in our church at that time, I don't even remember her name. She, she ended up moving a little later on came to me the next very next Sunday and said, here, Pastor, uh, here's my part. I want to be involved. And that little bag had those dimes and pennies, and I can't give it up because I love to pull it out and look at it whenever I start doubting. And I think about her faith. That's all she had, but she wanted to give it. Oh, I tell you, to me, that's the, that was the biggest down payment we ever made on this church. This little boy said, you can have it all. I'm not going to wonder about it. I'm not going to doubt it. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to give it. But look at Andrew. Sometimes we adults think things over too much. Andrew says, well, here, there's a lad here who had five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? The little boy believed the little boy got it because, you see, somehow the little boy understood, I'm going to give this to Jesus. I'm giving this to Jesus. I know what he can do. I've seen what he can do. I, folks have told me what he can do. I'm, I don't have much, but I know what he can do with it. He gave it to Christ, but here's the disciples who firsthand had seen miracle after miracle. Well, here's a little bit of bread and some fish. What, what's that with 15,000 people? Wow. Folks, your little bit can become a lot when Jesus sees that that's all you have to give. 2 Corinthians 8, 12, Paul said, for if there is first a willing mind, don't ever give because somebody's compelling you. Don't ever give because you feel like somebody's urging you or, or trying to make you feel guilty. No. Notice what he says. If there's first a willing mind, you only give to those things that you and the Spirit of God feel good about. Please always keep that in your mind because there's a lot of, a lot of mess on television and everywhere else. But if there's a willing mind, Paul says, it is accepted according to what one has. Listen, notice this, and not according to what he does not have. God doesn't want what you don't have. God doesn't want you starring. God doesn't care as much about what you give as he does the attitude in which you give it. He says he wants a cheerful giver. A person who's cheerful says, I can't wait to give this. I'm excited about giving this. I want to be a part of this. That's why here at the church, we don't ask people who are visiting to give. We just ask our members to give because we feel like our members see the benefits. They see the value. They see what Christ can do, and they love giving to the work of Christ. If you're visiting today, we don't want you to give. Kind of. <laughs> I mean, if you want to. I mean, if you have a willing heart. I'm a Baptist, leave me alone. <laughs> I was what? Anybody remember Art Link letter? That tells you how old I am. Yes, okay. I don't know why. I needed to laugh yesterday, so I, I got out to, you know, kids say the darndest things. And this little boy, he had asked this little boy about something, and, and he had been so 
tactful in his answer. I don't even remember what the question was, but he'd been so tactful in a heart link letter, said, wow, you must be a diplomat. And the little boy said, no, I'm just a Catholic Baptist. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay. No, that's tactful. Amen. <laughs> so, so you may be a, a Catholic Baptist here today. I don't know. Now, when you've identified the problem, you want a miracle? When you've identified the problem, you've accepted the responsibility for the problem, you've done what you can, then you're ready for step four. Expect a miracle. Expect a miracle. Verses 41 through 44, he says, And when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of the fish, of the fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men, remember, just the men, not, not counting the women and children. You see, God specializes, beloved, in taking things that are humanly impossible and doing them. Jeremiah 32 says, nothing is too hard for God. And Jesus said, all things are possible to him who believes. So no matter how big your problem is, God can handle it, folks. But you must do your part. You must do your part. Do what you can with what you have and expect God to take it from there. Some of you have not seen the miracle because you've just expected, you've seen God as a genie. I need this, and you stand back and wait. I rubbed the lamp, what's going on? I read a few passages, I quoted them, where, where are you at? Co-laborers, God wants to do things through us, not for us. Through us, not for us. With us, not for us. God's not going to do what you can do. I love what my friend uh, Harold Vaughn says. He says, if the Word of God says for you to do something, you don't have to pray about it. <laughs> he said, I have people come to me all the time and say, I'm praying, Brother Harold, if, if God wants me to do this. And he says, well, let's read it. Go and, and win disciples. Go and make disciples. What are you praying about? What are you asking God? He just says, go do it. Well, I'm just praying about if God wants me to do it or not. Let me say it again, Harold says. Go <laughs> and make disciples. Oh, okay. You don't have to pray about what God's already told you to do. You do your part. God's not going to do what you can do. He wants to do what you can't. He wants to do what you can't. And once again, I want you to envision, envision him as this good, good father that he is. And I want you to, to put this back down on earth like Jesus often did, telling pictures. I want you to see a good father who is showing his son how to change brakes on a car. And he lets the son take off the lug nuts. And he, lets him, he helps him remove the tire. And he, and he, but then he says to the son, notice he says to the son, now watch this. And he takes out that special tool that you have to have that, that separates all those springs and everything that if you don't have the right to, you've been there. He does. The son's hands are too little and the son's never done it before. And the son sits, sits there in awe watching daddy take that spring off and reach in that box and get those brake shoes. And he's, what, what he can't do, and he, listen, and he is in awe of his daddy. What I want you to know today is you and, you and I don't realize how much our God loves us and how much he wants a relationship with us. And he says, you come alongside me, you do what you can do, and then I want you to stand back in awe when I do what you cannot do and see what your everlasting God is capable of doing. And guess what? You stay with me and you'll do some of the same things. Don't you love him? Quit believing the lies the world's told you about God. He loves you. And he wants to work through you, not for you. He doesn't want to do everything for you. That's not a favor. That's looking down at you. 
And I want you to notice this. Oh, by the way, how many of this morning have said, I'm gonna, after this preacher, I'm going to expect God to work a miracle in my home, in my marriage, with my kids, whatever. And I want you to know something here. God even lets you choose. He even lets you choose your own degree of how much you're going to receive. What? Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith, let it be to you. You trust him for a little, you have a little. Trust him for a lot, you'll have a lot. But let me, let me warn you here. You, as a brand new believer, you probably ought to start out with, as a little. Right after I first got saved, the pastor was at my home church. It was a huge church. He got up and said, we need a million dollars. Kind of like what we did this morning. And, uh, man, I had just gotten saved. I believed everything all the time, anywhere. I was ready. So I started praying, God, send me the million dollars, and I promise I'll give it to you, the church. <laughs> I did. And I was serious. I went home and told Becky, and Becky was so kind. She said, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. wow. It's going to be fun to see how he sends it, honey. And I said, yeah. I believed it. I really did. It didn't happen. Time kept passing. Finally, the campaign was over, and I went to, I, I, I was just this way. Knocked to my pastor's door. I said, I'm upset, Brother Harold. And he said, what's going on, Russ? I said, I asked God to send me the million dollars. I said, I really believed it. I said, he didn't do it. He said, son, let me ask you a question. Have you ever trusted God for one dollar? I said, well, no. He said, you might want to start at one dollar. <laughs> oh. But after you've started, your faith determines what you're going to get. Determines what you're going to get. I want you to notice, they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of bread and of the fish. Not only did it give enough, the people were so full, they said, oh, I can't eat anymore, and they took up fragments. What does that tell you? When God's in it, you get more than you need. You get even more than you need. And that's why giving is always a test of faith. God wants you to see. Give this. I'll give you back even more than you give. Now, what's the central teaching of our, of our passage today? We've said it already three or four times. What we want God to do for us, He wants to do through us. Why? Because it's the only way we'll learn. And when it happens, God gets glorified and you and I get to see it firsthand. And we get to say, wow, not only did God do that, he used little old me. He used little old me to do that. You don't need self-esteem. You just need Christ esteem. You just need God esteem. You just need to have faith in a good, good father who says you are the most important thing in my eyes. That's what you need. Once again, Jesus could have said, let there be food, and there would have been food, but he didn't. He used the disciples. He waited, listen, until they got concerned, until they assumed responsibility for the problem, and until they did what they could do, and then he says, stand back and watch me. So remember this. If you need a miracle in your life, well, first of all, identify the problem. Be willing to admit that maybe you're part of the problem. The disciples were part of the problem because they wanted to procrastinate. They wanted to pass the buck. And they'd rather worry than have faith. Does that sound like you? Identify the problem. Accept responsibility for the problem. Do all you can and then you can expect your miracle. Now, you, we mentioned a, a man at the first of this. This man was very successful in his vocation. But, and at one point, all of his peers said, man, you've, you've probably reached the pinnacle of, of, of your vocation. And he decided to retire, even though he was a pretty young man. But then he began to struggle. He couldn't figure out why. He said to someone... I couldn't figure out who I was away from my vocation. Did you hear that? 
I couldn't figure out who I was away from my vocation. He went on to say, I was a train wreck. I was like a time bomb waiting to go off. I had no self-esteem, no self-worth. There were times where I didn't want to be here. I was, it was no good. I felt lost. That, that's a quote from him. This man who was so successful that his peers looked up to him. They yearned to be like him. And like a lot of people in our society today struggling with similar feelings, he did what so many do when that's going on, and he self-medicated. After he was arrested for several DWIs, he finally cut himself off from his family, his loved ones, his friends. He said this, and I quote, I thought the world would be better off without me. I figured the best thing I could do was just end my life. But praise God, he had a good friend. He had a good friend who didn't say, well, it's none of my business. No, this friend said, he's my friend, so it is my business. This other man looked up to this friend. In fact, he told people, he said, that guy's like, a, like, a, like an older brother to me. Oh, he had respect for this guy. And this guy came to his rescue, and here's what he said to him. He said, listen, when you are where you are, this is when we fight. This is when we get real character. This is when real character sh shows up. Don't shut down. If you shut down, we all lose, end of quote. And the friend convinced him to go to rehab. But he also gave him a book. The book changed his life. And he wrote his friend and said, man, <laughs> now you have to understand, this is a younger man. He said, this book is crazy. The things that's going on, oh my goodness, my brain, I can't thank you enough. You saved my life. You know what the book was? Purpose Driven Life. You know who the friend was? All pro former Baltimore Raven, Ray Lewis, outspoken Christian. And you know who the man was? Michael Phelps, the most decorated athlete in Olympic history. 23 gold, 28 over all. And Michael Phelps says, you know what? I'm driven now, but I'm purpose driven. I have a reason to live. Listen, I don't care if you're like Michael and you had success and now you, you, you doubt that that success was worth anything or if you have been struggling all of your life and you feel like that no one cares. God wants to work through you. He wants you to walk with him and co-labor and walk, walk with him and see him as he does miracle after miracle and realize that, wait a minute, not only does he do it, you can do it if you'll follow him. He wants you to be a part. He's a good, good father. He wants you to learn from it. He wants you to, he wants you to understand who he is. He wants you to see him caring. He wants you to see him healing others. He wants to see you healing broken homes. He wants to see you reaching the lost who are perishing into hell. He wants, to, he wants you to work with him. He wants you to be able to stand with him on that final day and say, he's my savior, but he's also my big brother, and he's also my good, good father, and he's also my instructor. He is my professor. He is my help. He is my power. He is my every." Thing. Let's bow our heads. We're going to do the invitation a little differently this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I've asked the Lord to help me just to try to get inside of, of your heart and your head. And while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and the folks are coming to lead our invitation all our heads are bowed would you respect your neighbor's privacy and is there anybody here today I'm looking over here to my left you're right you're far right my left preacher I need a miracle I admit it I see your hand I see yours I see yours I see yours I see yours 
I'm coming here toward the toward the the, the next right section. Anybody here? I see your hands here. Anybody else? I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Yes, sir. I see your hand. Now over here to my more to my right. I need a miracle in my life. Okay. Amen. Bless your heart. And I'm not talking about any wildfire thing. I'm talking about the real thing. Right over here to my right. Anybody else? I need a miracle. I see your hand here and back here. Amen. 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 Now I want to ask you this. In your particular situation, how many would say, preacher, I recognize I have no problem denying that I've been part of the problem. Anybody like that? God bless you. Anybody else? I've been part of the problem. I see it. Thank you. I've been part of the problem. I see yours back there, sir. Yes. Anybody over to my right? I see, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Anybody? I see. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Just remember that. If you'll identify the problem. Identify. I see yours, sir. Amen. If you'll identify the problem. Now, let me ask you this. Are you willing to take responsibility? If you are, raise your hand. I'll take responsibility. God bless you. God bless. I see all your hands all around. Amen. I see them. Thank you. God bless you. I'll take responsibility. You may need to go to somebody and tell them. You may need to talk to somebody. You may need to ask them for forgiveness in some ways. I'll take responsibility. Now, would you say, I'm willing to do what I can? I'll, I'll take my resources and do what I can. I will understand that God doesn't work for me. He works through me. Let me see your hands. He works. Amen. I'll do what I can. I'll do everything I can. I'll search the scriptures. I'll seek professional help. I'll do whatever it takes to find out what I can do. I'll do all I can. God bless you. God bless you. Are you willing to trust your good, good father to do the miracle? That's the next step. How many here would say, preacher, in the past, I, unlike the little boy, really didn't think that I had much to offer. Anybody like that? Bless your heart. You have so much to offer. Anybody? You have so much to offer. God bless you. You're a creation of God, made with all the parts and all the right tools to do whatever he needs for you to do. Don't let anybody else tell you anything different. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single one of these who raised their hand today, whatever it is they're facing, whether it's a broken marriage, whether it's, whether it's a wayward child, whether they are the wayward child, whether, whether it's, whether it's a, a problem in their neighborhood, a problem with their finances, a problem with their health, whatever it is, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, I pray God that they'll bring to you what they have, all they have, all that you ask of them, and they'll give it without doubt. They'll give it immediately, and they'll work with you, that they will change their attitude. They will see you working through them, not for them. Working through them for their faith and their maturity and your glory. Oh, Jesus, please, give each one of these folks the faith and the willingness to do what they can do and then to trust you to do the rest and before I say amen is there anybody here this morning that would say preacher I'm not a Christian or I'm not sure I'm a Christian I've never accepted Christ I've never been born again I'm not even sure what that means I, I, I've, I realize I've sinned though and I realize that Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I've been told that if I, if I cry out to God and admit my sinful nature, that he'll forgive me and make me a son and a daughter. Anybody like that? Pray for me that I'll be saved soon. Pray for me that, yes, God bless you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Anybody else? Thank you. For those who raised your hand, if you are ready, if you're ready today for the miracle of salvation, would you just pray a prayer like this? Just pray it right after me if you mean this with all your heart. Dear Father in heaven, I have sinned against you and against heaven. Oh, forgive me. I admit my sin. 
And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ went to that cross to pay the price for my sin so you could forgive me. I accept that payment of blood for my sin. And now, dear God, I give you all that I am.